started, I titled this morning's message, The Sounds of Thunder. The Lord had put on my heart about uh, John and James, the sons of Zebedee. And so I went and studied the scriptures that were pertaining to their lives. And uh, the Lord gave me a message to preach to you this morning <coughs> regarding these two brothers. Let's take a look at uh, Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22. We're going to start off with that passage of scripture. And, uh, we'll, and then we're going to get started. Amen. Matthew 4, 18 through 22. My passage here says, Jesus calls for fishermen. That was one of the things that I told somebody yesterday when I was handing him out a track. He had like one of these Costa shirts on with a marlin on it. I said, dude, you look like a fisherman. Read something from the greatest fisherman of all time. <laughs> he just got a smile. He's on the shirt. All right. Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren. Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway, that means immediately, left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw other two brethren. So he saw two other sets of brethren. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, <coughs> mending their nets. And he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. And I've explained many times to the people that typically come to the church that within the Bible stories, this is how I feel, this is how I teach the Bible. I'm, I'm a person that likes to write. I, I actually wrote a book. That's not important. I'm just trying to make the point that I wrote a book that I like to write. And God will allow writers to utilize various literary techniques to describe situations, allegory, you know, use things for illustration. And I've always been of the persuasion and the belief that, well, I know this, that the Bible is God's word. And the way that God spoke his word, now a lot of people don't believe that, but I'm, Paul said to young Timothy, who was a pastor, all scripture is inspired by God. The word inspired means, is in the Greek is theo, which means God, neustos, which means breathe. That means God breathed it. How did he breathe it? Well, he breathed it into man and through man. It's as though he used man as a pen. Now, it's important that I say this. I wouldn't plan on saying all this, but it's important to say this. God doesn't turn people into robots. Amen. He uses people the way that they are. We can, and we're going to see that in the lives of these boys, the sons of Zebedee, before it's over with. But what I'm trying to say is this, is that God is an author. Yes, he used man as instruments to write his word. But he chose the words within them. He is sovereign over the face of the earth. In other words, he's in control and he is allowing things to be played out. But yet at the same time, he's in control. Amen. What I'm trying to say is he's an author too. And he can also use various literary techniques. And what I'm trying to say is within the life of these young men, whatever they were called by the Lord or however old they were, I believe that we see elements of their life that speak more than what we're just seeing on the surface. In other words, they speak to truths of everyone's life. They speak to truths of the lives of believers. And the focus of my message, like I said already, is on John and James, the sons of Zebedee. And they were some of the first that Jesus called. And once again, the thought behind this message is that it compares their lives to the walk, I would say, of all believers. Of all people who would choose to follow after the Lord. We see certain aspects and characteristics in their life when we read the scriptures that pertain to them that are also relevant, if I could use that word, even though I don't really like it that much, relevant to our lives as believers. All right? One of the first thoughts, really point number one, if you happen to be taking notes, you don't have to, but if you like to, point number one, this is it, cast and amend. Cast and amend. What I mean by that is, is that God wants us to cast a net, but before we can ever cast a net, he has to make it. <coughs> the word casting really in the Greek, and I've written this right word before on the, paper, the, the board for you, is balo, B-A-L-L-O. It's where we get the word ball from, but literally it means to throw. So they're throwing a cast net. 
You understand what I'm saying? Like, I've tried to throw cast nets before. I think it's actually pretty fun. I don't. I can't say that I'm a great fisherman, but that's what they're doing. Part of what they're doing is they're casting their nets. That's how they did a lot of the fishing that they did back then. This word is also used to describe, sometimes the word is ek below. Ek means out, below means throw, throw out. Jesus ek below or cast out demons. The sower cast or threw seed. What was the sower? The, the sower was a representative of Jesus throwing the seed of God's word. Personally, for me, that's one of the reasons that I go and I'm so grateful for people that come with me. I believe that part of what we're doing when we hand out those tracks is throwing seed out there. Not everybody's even going to want one. And we, and we were, I was rejected on numerous occasions. I mean, I agree with Troy. There was a lot of people that were receptive, but I was definitely rejected a few times. But guess what? God is in control of that. You cast the seed, amen, and the seed lands sometimes on good soil. And when it does, it produces fruit. And so Jesus casted out devils, the sower cast seed, and the disciples, before they were followers of the Lord, cast a literal net to catch literal fish. But Jesus said, follow me, I'm going to make you fishers of men. God asks his people to make others aware of his truth. I wanted to make that statement because... I actually had a conversation with somebody who said he didn't believe in the Lord. And I tried to, I always use this scripture, if they'll let me have the time, that we're about to read out of Genesis chapter 18. Genesis 18, 17 through 19 is, the, is about the story of Abraham. That's part of why when you get truly saved, you start to feel compelled at some point in time to tell somebody about, else about the good news of Jesus. Yeah. And I tried to explain to this guy, I'm like, look, man, just pretend for me for with me for a second, because he don't believe in the God I believe in. Pretend with me for one second that there's a real God, and the real God is the one that I'm trying to tell you about. I'm here to tell you that his word says that he wants his people to tell others about him. That's why I'm here. In Genesis chapter 18, verse 17 through 19. Listen, this story goes all the way back before there was ever an Israel. <laughs> This is whenever God is, is first calling Abraham. And God, prom and God made one nation called Israel out of one man named Abraham. I got to tell you that. I know most of you know it because I tell it to you all the time. But I want to make sure we're on the same page. Look what he said in Genesis 18, 17 through 19. The Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I do? In other words, I'm going to show Abraham what it is I'm doing in this earth. Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. What does that mean? Most of you may know, but it means I'm going to make Abraham a nation and all the other nations are going to be blessed in him. Why are all the other nations blessed in him? Because God created a nation called Israel through Abraham and from Israel he gave the world Jesus. And every single person upon this earth, no matter whether they're from China, Venezuela, Singapore, it does not matter where they come from. If they will hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and give their heart, they will be blessed. Yeah. For I know him. This is, God, this is what God says. This is why I'm going to know Abraham. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. That the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. God says to Abraham, I'm going to bless all the nations of the earth through you. The Apostle Paul, listen, I'm not trying to get too deep into this this morning, but I want you to know the Apostle Paul told us thousands of years later in the New Testament that the blessing and the promise that God gave to Abraham was ultimately Jesus. And God told Abraham, or he's telling us through the word, I have known Abraham that he might teach his children and those that follow him about me. Because God wants people on this earth to know about him. Because listen to me, I'm convinced the story's real. And I know that most of you are too because yeah. you've experienced the presence of the Lord changing your life. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, and, and whenever I was telling that guy that didn't believe in the Lord, the story I was trying to get him to follow. And John later, my friend John said, dude, he was thinking. And I was like, I know he was. But then the girl that was sitting in the middle, she said, why your guy got to be right? I mean, why, why it got to be your story? Why not one of the other stories? And I said, well, if you give me just one second, I'll explain to you why I'm convinced. Because I was searching. 
and everything that I was trying to use to fulfill me left me empty and in more pain. We're about to get into that a little bit more. But whenever I heard the good news of Jesus and I had come to the end of myself and I gave my life and my heart to him, something happened on the inside of me. A miracle happened and it transformed me. The Bible teaches that God gives people a new heart. He creates a new heart in them and it transformed their life. Listen, you cannot argue with a person that's been born again. Amen. I use Robert's testimony a lot. He's he gave me permission a long time ago. I guess he's still cool with it. <laughs> Whenever he was in prison. And when he was in prison, they used to come to him and they'd have like this contraband stuff. Uh, it, I mean, it's like ramen noodles and peanut butter or something like that. And, but, it was, but they were selling it on the slit. They weren't supposed to do that. And so they said, well, go get Goldberg. He'll buy, that's what they called him. Go get Goldberg. He'll buy some of this stuff right here. Well, they, what they didn't know was, quote, unquote, Goldberg had an encounter with the Lord the night before. Hallelujah. He, he laid in his, in his rack and he said, he, whatever the prayer was, and the Lord came all over him and transformed him. And when he woke up the next morning, nobody had to tell him that he wasn't supposed to be buying peanut butter through the bars in a way that it wasn't supposed to be done because the Holy Ghost now lived in his heart and told him what was right from wrong. He didn't have to find a scripture in the Bible before he knew that it was wrong because a miracle had taken place in his heart and he told the guy, and he wasn't even rude to the dude from what I remember the story being. He said, look man, I appreciate you thinking about me, but I can't do that no more. I can't do that no more. And, and that's a big part of our message this morning. God will not leave you the same way that he found you. Yeah. When that miracle happens in your heart, and listen, to save time, not only did God say, I have known Abraham, that he would tell others after him. See, had somebody not told Robert, Robert would not have gotten saved. And since Robert's gotten saved, many other people have heard the good news of Jesus Christ. And Jesus also went on in the New Testament and he said, he said, follow after me. He said, baptize all nations in my, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them the things that I have taught you. God wants his people to cast a net. God wants his people to sow seed. But until, before we can cast, we've got to be mended. The word mended there literally means to put a thing in its appropriate condition. Something was messed up and it needed to be fixed and put right before it could be used for its proper purpose. I've told you all this story before, but I'll never forget it. I was when the Lord first got a hold of me, I was having a Bible study in my living room and there was a lot of young people that were coming to this Bible study. And we turned the lights dim back in the day. We'd play some music on the computer and them kids would worship the Lord. And then I'd try to do my best to stumble around some kind of message that I'd preach. And one day there was this young kid that showed up. I had never seen him before. And after everything was done, he's like, do you mind if I talk to you real quick? And so he says, he says, the Lord's given me a gift. And I'm, and I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm thinking, oh, Lord, here we go. I said, well, let's go in my brother-in-law's room over here. And, you know, because I didn't know what was going to happen. And he said, the Lord's given me a gift to have a vision. I get visions. And I had a vision of something that the Lord wanted me to tell you. And he said, the vision was that, and then he, when, he, and when he started to speak, okay, we're talking about casting nets to catch fish. Jesus called us to be fishers of men, but before we can cast a net, we got to have the nets mended. And in this vision, this, this, this kid tells me this. He said, I saw this vision. He said that there was a shrimp boat, and it had two nets on each side, like the butterfly nets that we see nowadays, and it had holes in it. And he said, as the boat was going, all the shrimp and the fish were going through the holes. And I said, and look, when he started talking, dude, I got, the, I mean, I knew that this was, this, I felt the Holy Spirit. And he said, I said unto him, Lord, what does this mean? He said, the holes in the nets represent the sin in his, that was in his life. So because of the fact that there's sin in our life, because of the fact that there's chaos in our life, there's holes in the net. God wants you and I to cast a net to catch fish. But before we can ever catch fish, he's got to mend the nets. And so anyway, the next scene, he said, there was another scene in my mind. And there was an old man on the boat and he was mending the nets. And I said, Lord, what does this mean? He said, tell him that I'm mending the nets. I'm mending the nets. And when he said that, I was just like, I don't mean to get all emotional, but 
I was overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed by the goodness of God. I was overwhelmed by the fact that God, I, I had a personal experience, just like I was trying to tell that atheist in the park and I was trying to explain to this girl, I had a personal experience with God. The presence of God rushed in and it changed me and I will never be the same. And you can't argue. I mean, I don't want to argue with anybody about God. I've learned that too the hard way, but you can't argue with a person that has experienced the miracle of salvation. That's right. Amen. So before we cast the net to be fishers of men, a mending has to take place. And the word mending there in the Greek language means to put something in its appropriate place. See, before we have a true relationship with Jesus, our life is full of holes. Can I get an amen? amen. Our life is full of holes. Sin causes wear and tear and leaves us fractured and in chaos. Our lives lack stability and the mending of the healing only starts once we truly give our lives to the Lord. The command for them is that they would leave their former life and follow Jesus. You know, I believe that people become too focused on the fact that they change their occupations. I, I think what we need to come. Oh, they went from being a fisherman to a preacher. Hold on a second. No, they changed their former way of life. <laughs> they left their old life and they embraced a new life. That's really what salvation is all about. God gives you new life. I, I don't have time to even cover the scriptures that talk about the fact that salvation causes a creative miracle to take place on the inside of the heart, changes the old man and turns him into a new man. God, that's what God does. They left their former way of life and they followed after him. They left what they had always known and they followed him. And when a sinner gets saved, they leave their former life and they follow Jesus. Now, look, I'm not I'm not talking about listen to me. I'm not talking about just going to church. <laughs> they are converted from sinners to saints and the Holy Spirit starts to change the way. And I'm going to explain this. So 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 if you know, I'm going to get into this a little bit deeper. So just give me a second to work on this. The Holy Spirit starts to change the way that they walk. He changes the way that they talk and their focal point changes from being consumed with their own life. To be con consumed with the new life that he has given them. Yes, I got to tell you something. Salvation results in a radical change. Amen. I want to take a look at a couple of scriptures on the board here. Colossians 1, 13 through 14. I want to show you what people are before salvation. I'm sorry. I want to show you what I was before salvation. Who, talking about Jesus, has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. I just want to take, I know I use this scripture a lot, but I just want to make a point that the Bible teaches that the first time you were born in your physical birth, you were born like Adam into the kingdom of darkness and you were born a sinner. I didn't write that. God wrote that in his word. Amen. But whenever you get saved, what you need to understand is that the whole purpose Jesus came was to deliver us. From darkness to light. Amen. To deliver us from darkness into the kingdom of the sun. Look at the next scripture. This one really tells it. I put it in the track. I'm sorry, not the next verse. The next scripture, which is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. Ephesians 2, 1 through 2. Look at this. And you has he quickened. The word, you know what the word quickened means? It means to give life to. It means that something was previously dead. And now it's been given life. I mean, there was an old gun, country, uh, country West, old Western movie called The Quick and the Dead. That's, that's what it meant, the, the living and the dead. You were dead, but he gave you life. How were you dead? You were dead in trespasses and sins. Look at the next verse. <coughs> Where in time past, in your past, you walked according to the course of this world. Do you realize that the majority of people are headed in a certain direction? Everybody says that it's okay. Everybody says that the way that, you know, however you want to live your life, that's the new mantra nowadays. Listen, I talked to about six different teenage kids yesterday and, the, and, and Friday that did not even know about Adam, that did not know that they were born sinners, and did not even know that Jesus died on the cross for their sin. And two different people said, yeah, that's because their parents 
don't know the Lord themselves. Listen, when I was 16, I was dropping acid, snorting coke, and doing drugs. I was chasing after every girl I could get my hands on. But to be truthful, guess what? I knew that I was living wrong, and I knew that Jesus was the answer that I needed. I was just being rebellious towards it. We are in the midst of a perilous society. The world is going according to a course. But look where the course is going. According to the prince of the power of the air. Who is that? That's talking about the devil. The prince of the power of the air. The enemy is in the atmosphere. You don't have to believe it. Sometimes whenever people hear spiritual stuff, it freaks them out. The Bible is very spiritual. God is very spiritual. There are demonic spirits that drive people to go in a direction that they're not supposed to go. And look who he works in. He works in the children of disobedience. People that refuse the gospel message. And listen, I refused it for a long time. <laughs> But if we keep rejecting the gospel, we are still the children of disobedience. We're heading in a direction that the majority of the world is going, and it's wrong to go that way. And instead, we're supposed to, to trust in the Lord. We were dead in trespasses and sins, but look, this is the good news. You know, before you get good news, there's, there's some bad news. Look at Ephesians 1.13. It says, in whom you also trusted. That's talking about Jesus. After you heard the word of truth. When you hear the word of truth and you trust in Jesus, look what happens. It's, it, 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 you, when you respond to the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You know what that means? It means the Holy Spirit, when you get saved, comes to live in your heart. The Holy Spirit, when you get saved, comes to... It's, it, the Bible goes on to say... That it's a down payment. It's proof that he's coming back again. It's proof to you that you're going to heaven. That's how that change happens. Before you were saved, you were one way. And after you're saved, you're different. God changes us and uses us for his glory. This brings me to point number two. These brothers were known as the sons of Zebedee. Point number two is God's gift. That's point number two, God's gift. Why is that point number two? Because that's what Zebedee means. Zebedee's name means Jehovah's gift. Now that's amazing to me that Zebedee's name means Jehovah's gift. Because you know why? Because it's talking about a father and his two sons. And why it's amazing to me is that the father gave a gift, which was his son. Look at John 3, 16 through 17. God gave us a gift. You need to know that. I started telling people at some point in time when I handed them, hey, look, when, if they look like they didn't want what I was giving them, I'm like, man, it's a gift. I'm giving you a gift. I know that they think, oh, it's a stupid little piece of paper. What's a gift about that? Some people are thinking that, not everybody. It's a gift because it's got the precious word of God in it. And it tells you about God's plan. And it can bring you hope yes. into your life. It says right here in John 3, 16 through 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God so loved the world that he gave. He gave a gift. You see that part about not wanting to condemn? I want to point that out real quick. Because, look, people nowadays are confused. People nowadays are confused. Preachers don't want to tell people that sin has to be repented of. You know why? It, you know what it means to repent of sin? It means to change the mind and to change the direction. It, it, to confess sin, the word in the Greek is homologia. You know what we get? Homo. It means same. Logia means speak. In other words, it means you got to think and speak the same thing as God. If God says something sin, you got to convert. You're, you have to be converted over to God's way of thinking. But listen, people are confused and they think that that people are condemning them when they talk about sin. But you can't be born again if somebody doesn't tell you that you're born a sinner and that you need a savior. The reason that people are confused is that the scripture says that God sent not his son to condemn the world. And they hear preaching about sin and they think you're condemning me. You're judging me. Only God can judge me. Well, hold on a second. No. When the love of God enters into the heart, he tells his people, you have to tell them about my love. They have to know about the gift I gave them. You have to tell them that I sent my son as a gift. He died for them as a gift. And if they will believe 
that he died for them and turned from their sin, I will give them the gift of righteousness. To save time, Romans 5.17 says Jesus gave us a gift. The gift that he gave us was his righteousness. And listen, once you receive the righteousness of Jesus as a gift, look at Romans 6.23. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm telling you that the Bible teaches that the opposite of eternal life is eternal death. <laughs> We're not talking about you go to sleep. That's what the Jehovah's Witnesses teach. Oh, you soul sleep. You just go night, night in the grave. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that those that have not re repented of their sin have not, and it, it, you know, have not. People say, but I'm not that bad. Hold on a second. Your goodness can't, if, if your goodness could get you into heaven, do you think that the father would have sent his son to die naked on the cross? No, absolutely not. But if you will receive the gift of Jesus' righteousness through believing in the gospel message, you will receive the gift of eternal life. So it shouldn't be seen as condemning or judging. Instead, it should be seen as telling the truth and spreading the gift of love. Condemnation and judgment comes to those who reject the truth of Jesus. That brings me to point number three. This is point number three. You won't be the same in Jesus' name. That's right. Now, I'm going to cover a lot of stuff in this particular point right here. I don't think I'm going to be here that much longer. Y'all going to get out of here early today. But what I do want to tell you is this. I'm going to cover some, clarify some of the things that I just said. With that said, I will say that sometimes believers can be so zealous. Like, in other words, you're, you're not going to be the same in Jesus' name. Amen. In other words, we're saying by faith. You're not going to be the same that you were before you met Jesus. Right. But with that said, sometimes believers can be so zealous with a zeal mean. It has the idea of fire, fervor. It has the idea to be burning. So believers can mean well, but, and they can be so zealous to tell other people about the Lord that guess what they do? They do it in a judgmental way. Instead of operating in the love of the Lord, which is to tell people, the good news of Jesus Christ to let them know that God loved them and that he sent his son Jesus to die for them. Their attitude is more like they want to be the judge. And, and listen, I have, I have a hard time even like yesterday handing out some of those things like the ones that I got most interested, most frustrated with are the people that they're just they're, it's not so much that they're not responsive because I get that some people just. They don't even know how to respond. There's some, I can remember talking to one guy and his girl, afterwards I said, man, thank you for, you know, thank you for your time. And his girlfriend was like, thank you. What, and I'm not trying to make fun of her. What I'm trying to say is, is that I literally believe that to some people it freaks them out so bad because they just don't understand why would somebody be out here telling, talking about Jesus. It freaks me out. It's so weird. So what I do is sometimes I'm like, it's weird, huh? <laughs> as we, I know it is. It comes across as weird that somebody would come out here to talk about Jesus. But the reason that I do it is because he changed me. And I feel compelled that I have to tell you Amen. the yeah. good news of the gospel. Yeah. So I get that it feels weird. And I'm not going to be able to change them, you know, from feeling weird. Maybe that. And then sometimes when I say that, they like, no, they like laugh, you know, kind of like you did. Oh, man. It's like when they see your personality a little bit. Sometimes they see you're a real person. It kind of makes it makes some sense to them. It kind of calms some things down. But, you know, there's a difference between somebody being convicted. Conviction is a spiritual thing that is of God. Amen. The Holy Spirit will convict you. What does that mean? It, he will show you that you're not right. And it feels uncomfortable. And sometimes people don't understand that. Listen. The first time I sat in a church with my long hair coming off the streets of Lafayette with my sister and went to church over there in Berwick and that woman kept preaching. She said, the blood, the blood. I felt so uncomfortable. I was like, what is going on? And I didn't realize it was the conviction of the Holy Spirit. He was pleading with me. He was saying, you're not right. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, dude, she stopped in the middle of that message and she said, Somebody in here, the Lord is dealing with your heart. And when she said that, I'm just telling you what happened. My heart started beating out of my chest. Physically, I was, God was doing something to me. She said, you need to come up here right now and you need to give your heart to the Lord. 
Dude, I did. <laughs> I wasn't. I didn't care what nobody thought, man. I just. I got up in the middle of it and I, I kneeled down. And when I did, I felt almost like a sack of cement fell off my back. There's a difference between conviction from the Holy Spirit and then people trying to make people feel condemned. What I'm going to try to tell you is that John and James handled it that way. They, 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 there was a time in their life that they did not have the love of the Lord the way that they were supposed to. And we're going to get to that in a second. We oftentimes have a habit as believers of quickly forgetting where we used to be. That's right. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. You can't expect people that, that have not given their heart to the Lord or really learn the ways of God to act anything like Jesus. They don't know anything about that. Amen. It's a process of learning. Amen? Amen? I mean, Lord knows for the first year you got saved, you sure enough didn't act a whole lot like Jesus. <laughs> I mean, that's what I'm trying to say. Like, sometimes we get saved and we expect everybody in the world to act like the church. No, dude. When you, 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 been, and you know, one of the things that the Lord showed me, Matt, you've been living like, you've been living like the old man for, for 20 something years. Doing all of this stuff that you did. And now you think that just because you gave your heart to the Lord immediately, you're going to look more like exactly like Jesus. There is a change. Don't misunderstand me. But also there's a progressive change that continues on. I guarantee if you give your life to the Lord, he will bring you along as fast as he wants to bring you along. And he will change you. Amen. God is the one that cleans it up. God is the one that changes. It's not my job. Listen, they got churches all around here that will try to make a bunch of rules and regulations for people. Try to tell the women that they got to, that they got to wear long dresses and can't wear makeup and all that, all that kind of stuff. Make a bunch of rules and regulations and they pretend that that's some kind of outward holiness. That's not the Bible. God, God will do what the Holy Spirit wants to do is he wants to move into the heart. And he wants to reveal to the heart his will for the person. Now, it's always going to line up with his word. He definitely doesn't want people dressing inappropriately, right? He definitely doesn't want people dressing, continuing to dress like the world or act like the world, talk like the world, walk like the world. But once again, it doesn't happen overnight. And it's not the job of the church to tell people how to live, how to dress, how to act, how to do... It's the job of the church to teach the scriptures and what the Lord said and allow the Holy Spirit Amen. to reveal to them Amen. his will. Amen? Amen. I don't know about you, but when I first got saved, first, one of the first things I did, I was, I, I, I was acting just like these boys right here that I wrote my little sister a letter. And I said, the Bible says that fornicators will not enter the, enter the kingdom of God. She said, and you know what her response was? She wrote me a letter back. She said, well, then you in trouble, dude. <laughs> I was trying to, I was trying what the best way I knew how to tell. And what I told her was the truth. And she, but she didn't understand what I was saying. So she took it as condemnation. See, and maybe part of my personality, the way I was saying it was condemning. Okay. That's the point that I'm trying to make. We forget so often. I use those two scriptures to save some time. We're not going back. But in Colossians 1.13, we forgot that we were in darkness and that he moved us into light. And in Ephesians 2, we forgot that we used to walk the course of the world and we followed this prince of the power of the air, that we were being led. Listen to me. I, told, I can't tell you how many people that I told last night when I felt like I was losing them because I couldn't talk to them about Jesus because they don't understand. Some of these teenagers are like, dude, who's Adam? Who, I'm born a sinner. Who's Jesus? They don't, they don't know any of that. And, I, and so what I would ask them, I would say, okay, well, let me explain it to you like this. The whole music industry is like the course of the world. Because it's, why, let me tell you why. Because it's preaching a message that's different than what the gospel teaches. The music industry, basically, I'm talking about hip hop now. And the only reason I don't even listen to hip hop, I'm just, I just know that I've read a lot of the lyrics. And I'm basically, I'm going to give you a paraphrase of what the hip hop industry says make my flesh feel good. Give me some stuff to make my flesh feel good. And whatever that stuff is, you know what I'm talking about. And I tried to tell people yesterday I, there are certain things that make our flesh feel good. 
That's why I did drugs. That's why I drank alcohol. That's why I tried to meet a new girl every day. Because it made my flesh feel good. But the Bible says it's sin. Yeah. And with the music industry is telling people, no, man, you got to go grab all you can get. And if anybody stands in your way, pop a bullet in them. I mean, that's the new that's the new word now, right? right. I mean, that's what they're singing out there, right? Yeah. That's the course of the world. We forgot that we used to be that way. We might not have been in the hip-hop genre because they didn't even have that back in my day. When I got <coughs> first gave my heart to the Lord, all they had was Rapper's Delight. Y'all probably don't even remember that. Huh? <laughs> that was I had that album. <laughs> I tell you, I hold on. It's a whole different ball game now. It is, and, it, and don't tell me it ain't influencing the world because it is. Yeah. And that's what people are being raised on. We, but we forget that we used to be in darkness. We forget that we used to walk that way. Now, I want to I wanna tell you that Jesus changed their name. He changed the name of these boys. Their name was, son, they, were, they were known to us, introduced to us as the sons of Zebedee, the sons of Jehovah's gift. But look what Jesus changed their name to, Mark 3.17. It says, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, and he surnamed them Boanerges, which is the sons of thunder. He changed their name. You know what this word means? It means sons of commotion. The name seems to denote fiery, destructive zeal that may be likened to a thunderstorm. The word also means chaos and tumult. <laughs> God will, what I want you to know is this, is that God will use zeal for his kingdom. He will. Everybody in this room is different as far as a personality. I tend to be a zealous type person. If there's anybody in this room that has ever been guilty before of telling people, about, trying to tell people about the love of God in a condemning way, I've been guilty of that. And God has dealt with me about that. And people still feel like I'm condemning because of the way I preach, because I get loud. <laughs> I had one lady that she, she left the church to put on Facebook. I ain't never going to no church again with some preacher going to sit there and yell at me. Ain't nobody yelling at you. <laughs> I mean, if anything, I'm yelling at the devil. And, and not only that, I'm just passionate. Yeah. Jesus changed me. But, but, I, but I get it that there's some people that just don't like loud preachers. I get that. You got a lot of soft-spoken preachers, you know, and if and if people don't like loud preachers, I try to get some soft-spoken. And I don't know if anybody that I get to come in here is really soft-spoken, but, but there's nothing wrong with being passionate about Jesus. So God will use zeal, Amen. But there is also the possibility that our zeal without knowledge can cause destruction and chaos to God's kingdom. We said it earlier, with conversion, there's a radical change. You won't be the same in Jesus' name, but that doesn't mean that he makes us robots. He created us a certain way. We are individuals with certain personality traits, and when he saves us, he uses us for his kingdom. Listen, I was, somebody came from the church with me, and, and, the, and, the, and the, the person's personality is probably the opposite of mine. And they were like, I, this is the best Friday night I think I've ever had. But I, I feel like apprehensive to hand these things out. I'm like, you know what? I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you came and that you're with me. Don't stress about handing out. We're different. Our personalities are different. It doesn't mean that you'll never, you know what I'm saying, feel more comfortable doing it. I'm just glad you came. Praise God to, to help support, to pray, to, to, to make a prayer. We're not all the same. God, even though he changes us, he doesn't turn us into robots. You're still going to be you. He's just going to work on the old you and turn it into a new you. Amen. I guarantee you that there were elements of these guys. I'm talking about James and John before they followed Jesus that were thunderous. And that there were still elements of their personality after they followed Jesus that were thunderous. That God, and what we're about to see, God, though, can use some of it, but some of it, it'll cause problems for his kingdom. This is an example of when it causes problems. This is kind of like a long passage of scripture. Y'all just bear with me as we go through it. All right. Luke 9, 51 through 56. 
Well, this isn't the longest one. I got another one after that. We're really doing pretty good on time, though. It's like only 10.38. Thank you, ma'am. And it came to pass, when the time was come, that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. So what that's saying is, is that it was time, Jesus knew it was time for him to go to the cross. And he put his, he, he put his face towards Jerusalem because he knew that's what was going to happen. He was going to go there and he was going to be crucified. And it says that he sent messengers before his face, before him, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans. Now, we don't have time to break it down, but I got to tell you that the Samaritans hated the Jews. The Jews hated the Samaritans. The Samaritans hated the Jews. It's kind of like it was kind of like racism. It really was. It was a form of racism. I know that's a big topic. <coughs> The Samaritans hated the Jews because the Jews looked down on them. And so it says he sent people before him to Samaria to make it the place ready for him. But whenever they got there, it says they did not receive him because his face was as though he was going to Jerusalem. So when they heard he was going to Jerusalem, that that was his destination because they hated the Jews so much. And I went, we don't want none of him. We don't want none of this man and what he's got to say. I hate to say it, but that's a lot of the reason why many people out there don't want to hear about the Lord because of the way the exposure that they've had to Christians in the past that have treated them improperly. Amen. That's another story. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, so they're like, you don't want our Jesus? What's wrong with you? When they saw this, they said, Lord, how about you let us command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just like Elijah did? That's what they want to do. Oh, you're not going to receive our Jesus? We're going to call down fire from heaven and we're going to destroy you. Look what Jesus said. He turned and rebuked them. The word rebuke is a strong word. It's like you were wrong and somebody brought correction into your life. Have you ever been corrected like that, dude? I don't know. There's been times in my life I didn't like it, man. I didn't like the way it made me feel. Jesus turned around and rebuked them. And that's what he says. He said, you know not what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man is not to come, destroy, come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Jesus came to save the lost and his own followers that, are follow, that have left their fishing enterprise and have followed Jesus and have saw his miracles, they're operating under a different spirit. They're not operating under the Holy Spirit right now. So listen to me. Whenever you go and you, and you engage another believer... This is something that I had to learn, too, because yesterday it happened. I went to hand. I know I keep talking about yesterday or the day before, whatever, because it's fresh on my mind. I went to hand this lady a track. She said, I'm good. I'm a believer. I don't want that. <laughs> and so I'm like, it didn't work with her. She just got harder as it went on, but it worked with some other people. I'm like, well, good then. It seems like to me you would be happy that somebody else is out here telling somebody about the Jesus that you love. But when I said that, she didn't. She wanted less. <laughs> so all I'm trying to say is, is that she, I, I believe personally, I mean, you may not agree, that she was of that spirit. Sometimes like the other spirit. That's not the Holy Spirit. Even if you don't want to go out there and tell other people about Jesus, if you love Jesus, you're glad that other people are telling people about Jesus. Yeah. Now, I will tell you this. I've seen that there's a guy that goes to the Decadence Festival. It's supposed to be this afternoon, the uh, parade over there in New Orleans. It's the uh, homosexual parade. And there's a guy that goes over there to preach to people, and he holds up a sign that says, God hates fags. Oh. I'm going to tell you right now, dude, I'm not down with that. Ooh. That is not the Lord. That's the wrong spirit. Yeah. Yep. God loves sinners. God died for men and women's sin. And it doesn't matter what flavor it is. God loves people. And he, but, but at the same time, he wants people to know you got to repent. And you got to turn from where you've been and where you got to embrace the new life. God, you will not be the same in Jesus' name. You know, like, I don't know if this story means, goes along with this a whole lot, but one last night, I would, it was me and Mike. We were walking. And I handed this dude a track. He was kind of off by himself, sitting under the bridge. 
And I told Mike Lair, I said, man, the dude was smoking a joint right there. And I knew he was. I smelt it. I saw him. I saw what he was doing. I said, I'm going to give this dude a try. Not, let me tell you what my thinking was. I mean, and, I'm, and this dude did not care, bro. I mean, he had the grill. He had the dreads. And when I walked up, he wasn't the least bit alarmed. He was like, what's up? And I said, man, I just wanted to give you this to tell you how much Jesus loves you, dude. That he died for your sin. He died on the cross for you, man. He loves you. He's like, thanks, bro. Amen. But you know what I was thinking in my head? I was thinking if this dude is this bold in the world, because Mike was like, man, he don't care the police. I said, that dude don't care about no police. He ain't scared of the police. He done probably been arrested so many times, he laughed. He just swallowed that stuff. There ain't no evidence. He ain't going to catch me. I, I hate to admit it, but I did that one time. I was over there. I had to stuff in my mouth, and they said, cops are going. I probably shouldn't brag about that kind of thing. But my, but my point is, is that I'm thinking if he's that bold, he gives his heart to Jesus, and he gives his heart to Jesus. Can you imagine what he do for the kingdom? Hallelujah. Lord, I, I lift him up to you right now, and I pray that you move on his heart, Amen, and save his soul. Amen. Because he has some zeal. The Lord's gonna have to work some things out, and then he might want to call some fire out on people at first. But 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 you know what? The Lord knows how to work with that. Listen. To save a little time, Romans 8, 29 says that God conforms us into the image of Jesus. Amen. It describes a molding taking place. When you give your heart to the Lord and the Lord comes to live in your, inside of your heart, that what ends up <coughs> happening is, is that the presence of God begins to mold you Amen. and make you look less like the world Amen. and more like Jesus. Hallelujah. Each and every day, he's changing. Amen. He molds us to look more like his sacrificial love and less selfish. Can anybody agree with me? Because I'm about to close with this next scripture. Can anybody agree with me? This is a long passage of scripture, though. Can anybody agree with me that for the most part, mankind is pretty selfish? I'm talking about all of us to some extent. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm trying to, I'm trying to make a point here. Like, even whenever we want to do something good for somebody, a lot of times in the back of our mind, if we're yeah. honest with one another, like, yeah, well, if I do this, then I might get this. Yeah. See what I'm saying? Yes. That ain't how Jesus was. <laughs> Jesus gave his life. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, that means that we were against him. Jesus died for the ungodly. Jesus gave his life. I want you to see in this next passage of scripture about these boys, John and James, how be before the Lord really had, a, you know, as time went on, they were changed. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you the story of how they how they lost their life in the end real quick. But there was a time in their life. Not only did they want to call fire down from heaven like Elijah did, but they were very caught up in their own selves. You know, a lot of times people, when you start coming to church, you still we still think that it's all about us. Well, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. Well, okay. I mean, nobody can make anybody do anything. But to be truthful, the love, when the love of Jesus enters your heart, sometimes you do things that are sacrificial for the benefit of the kingdom and not necessarily that it, is, it didn't benefit you, if that makes sense. Let's look at Mark 10, 32 through 37 real quick. <laughs> it says, and, and when they were in the way going up to Jerusalem, so Jesus is going to Jerusalem, he's about to be crucified. Jesus was, went before them and they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. And he took again the 12 and began to tell them what things should happen unto him, saying, behold, we go up to Jerusalem and the son of man shall be delivered to the chief priests, to the scribes. And this is what they're going to do. They're going to condemn him to death. And they're going to deliver him to the Gentiles. In other words, the people that don't believe in God. Then it says, and they're going to mock him. You ever been clowned before? People like try to ridicule you, make fun of you. Yes. They used to call me Fat Matt the River Rat. I got so used to it, it didn't even bother me anymore. But, but I'm just trying to say, like people ridicule you and mock you and make fun of you. And shall scourge him. That means take a whip and beat his back. And shall spit on him and shall kill him. And the third day he shall rise again. Now, this is what I really want you to see. The next verse. I mean, right off the heels of this, this is what James and John, the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder, say to the Lord. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him saying, Master, we would that you would do something for us. 
Whatever we desire, we want you to do this for us. And so Jesus says unto them, what would you have that I would do for you? They said unto him, grant unto us that we may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left hand in your glory. Wait, hold on a second. Are you even serious for one second? Jesus is over here saying, I'm warning you guys now. I see the fear in your face. I want to console you, but the reality of it is this. When we get to Jerusalem, I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be condemned. Condemned to die. They're going to scourge me. They're going to beat me. They're going to whip me. It didn't say it right there, but in another place, they're going to pull the beard out of my face, and they're going to spit on me, and they're going to mock me. And their next response is, Lord, can we sit on your right hand when you come into glory? How can you get any more selfish? So what I want to leave you with, if nothing else today is, is this, is that if you're a selfish believer, or Lord, help us all to see the selfishness in us. Yes then we need to ask the Lord to take that out. Amen? But I also want to say this. If you've experienced some selfish believers before in your past, can I just say this? It's not God's fault. It's not God's fault that people still act that way. God wants to change people, but many times people are resistant. Right? I do want to say that, uh, I do want to say that, and this is, I'm really closing right now. These brothers live for Jesus until the day they die. It sounds, it's like, how could God use people like that? But guess what I ask? How could God use somebody like me? Amen. Amen. And what I want you to see is Acts chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. This is talking about James. He's the first recorded person to die for Jesus in the Bible. I mean, the first disciple. Stephen was the first Martyr, other than a other than an original disciple, it says in Acts twelve one through two, this is talking about King Herod. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. It means he persecuted the church of Jesus Christ, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. You might say that James had a wrong spirit at one time because he wanted to call fire down from heaven. You might say that James was selfish at one point in time of his life because he wanted to sit at Jesus' right hand and that's all he was worried about instead of the fact that Jesus was going to the cross. But one thing you cannot say, James, one thing that also that happened with James is that he lived for Jesus till the end. And that whenever they asked him, that he would not shut his mouth. He lived for Jesus. He told people about Jesus. And when they didn't like it, he would rather take the sword, I'm just assuming, in his belly than he would to shut up and not tell the truth about Jesus. As far as for John, his brother, he was imprisoned on the Isle of Patmos for preaching the gospel. He was imprisoned for preaching, not for doing something else. And God used him mightily to write 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, the gospel of John, and the book of Revelation. I guess really I just wanted to tell you this morning that we're all a work in progress. God wants to use us to be fishers of men, but he has to mend our lives also. Many times there's holes in our lives, but the presence of God, if we'll give our heart to him, can mend those holes.